genre that you wanted to work in, and then you sort of figured out a story that would fit. Did it did it start with somebody like Oliver, and you sort of built the story up from that? What's the what's the inspiration here? It's kind of a combination of things. I think mean, Oliver crept in quite early, um, and I kind of knew him. I think people, everyone who kind of makes things know sometimes you you have kind of imaginary friends that stay, and he was one of them, and. Um, I wanted to, I've been wanting to make something that is part of the kind of classic British Gothic kind of subgenre, which I've been calling um, something happened in a country house one summer that none of us ever got over. <laughs> 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 sort of the brides have been visited and the go-between and atonement and sort of any number of those kinds of films. And it's always so fun to go with quite a specific genre, I think, because you know, it means you can always kind of squeeze it <laughs> quite hard and see how, see what pops, I guess. Um, and yeah, I wanted to write something about love and about sex and about our relationship with the things that we want and how often we, the things that we really, really want are the things that sort of disgust us or make us feel disgusted with ourselves, the things we know we shouldn't love. And I think, you know, this could have been set in the Hamptons, it could have been set in a compound in Malibu. It, I think, well, up to a point in a slightly different way, but, you know, we, we all spend our life as voyeurs now, we look at people, and we look at them, we look at them, we look at them, and, and we, we are mean about them, and we, but we want them, we want to be them, we want to have their lives, we want to get inside, and it felt like a really great place to start, I think. I mean, that's a universal sensation, probably now more than ever, and I mean, you've referred to this as a vampire movie, in terms of the idea of somebody taking and you know wanting and taking, uh, it does feel. I mean, it's funny that you brought up this being you know part of that kind of English tradition of things happening in a country house because the English class system is so different than the American class system. We like to pretend that we don't have a class system, and then you try to board a commercial flight at an airport, and you immediately realize that that's a fault. You know, of course there's a class system here. We just hide it, whereas the English don't. And that's why I think this would work fine in the Hamptons, but the fact that it's happening in England in 2006 is, um, I think it's quite key to the, what makes this film work. No, no, you're right. But I think, um, well, the thing that's, that is so specific, I suppose, about the English class system is that it's so old. And so it has been, there have been so many years to make all of those little tricks, have all of those little codes and layers. You know, every single house like this has its own egg situation at breakfast, you know. So it's not even like you could go from one place to another and be like, thank fuck, I've learned what to do. They're all different. And everyone's, you know, there's there's the sort of, I mean, I think Britishness is is just endlessly fascinating. I did, <laughs> this is quite, maybe might be a bit of a tangent, but I tried, went to an improv class once. <laughs> it was terrible, really like grotesquely terrible. And I could see the teacher's face just fall. And she said, you know, English people find improv very difficult because when, you know, you, I say, come on, and you've got to be an angry guy in a coffee shop. You know, if you're American, you'll come and be like, get me my fucking coffee. And if you're English, you'll say, can I have a coffee, please? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the angriest. That's like, whoa. <laughs> and I think that's the thing is that we are humor. It's irony. You know, it's puns. It's double talk. It's you know, oh, come sit by me, we hate titles, but everyone's watching all the time. You know, it's, it's constant judgment, and it's, it, it just, I think it makes it much more kind of complicated. And also it's just like, we've, we've been so expert at exporting it. So I think the, the British country house as a place, and, as a, and, and it's kind of the rules of it, because of all of our shows and our books and our movies, every, it's kind of universal, everyone. Everyone knows, like, when the butler makes a certain face, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, we've we've all grown up on PBS here. Like, we yes, understand exactly. what this means. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, as a, you said you've been a fan of this genre. As you're going in and constructing this story, were there conventions that you wanted to honor? And were there specific things that you wanted to kind of play with and subvert? Because it's very, very fertile ground for both of those things when you're talking about the, the summer that changed our lives at the English country house that we don't ever talk about? It's really difficult. I think part of it is tonal, and it's a kind of natural thing. So, so 
uh, often I'm not quite sure to what extent it's, you know, I'm consciously doing something, but certainly in the beginning, you know, the Gothic tradition usually start, it usually has a framing narrative. You usually have somebody looking back at a specific time, um, talking about it, it gives it, you know, um, that sort of, the, the story within the story. Um, so there were kind of cons construction things like that, I suppose. And and the outsider, you know, we have it in we have it in so many sort of novels. The the kind of person who wants to be in, I, I think they can be, you know, they're the innocent bystander usually. The person who's like, oh, how did I get here at Gatsby's mansion? You know, look it in, it's like that kind of person. But you know, but but really, it just it feels like there's a kind of time in your life where you feel things, you feel things differently to any other time and, and I suppose that kind of university college moment is a very ripe ground and, and you know you're in one place so it, it's a kind of constant yearning like burning intensifying you know thing yes I realize this is going to be a loaded question so I apologize in advance uh, you studied for a little while at Oxford right were there was there any of your experience whatsoever that you brought to this film? Which is not to say that this is about your experience at Oxford. Um, <laughs> preface that. <sighs> there aren't any cops in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I threw up in a lot of sinks. <laughs> so there's that. I think, you know, I, the experience I had, maybe whether it was an experience or whether it was just an observation was that I worked really hard to get there. I wanted to, you know, I really wanted it in a way that was sort of um, Tracy Flick levels of kind of psychotic. <laughs> I, had a I had a fetish for it. I think lots of people who go to these sorts of places do. And I worked really, really hard and I got there and I realized immediately that working hard was like pathetic. To turn up to tutorials having like read anything was sort of like impossibly gauche. That all the rules that you've been told your whole life, and it, and it might have been a type of gentle thing, certainly, you know, for lots of other people was a class thing. You know, it's, 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 you're never in. You're never in, you get in and you're never in. And they talk about it in G. Uh, the Obscure and in Bride's Head, that thing of the door within the door. Every time you get in, there's another door, and and I think that's the thing about this place and about Felix too, is you can there's never you never get any purchase really. You can only look. Which is I mean this is kind of what plagues Oliver Quick, which by the way great name, uh, that he thinks once he gets in the Oxford he's in, he's made it, he's actually ascended the class system, and then he finds himself just having to deal with an entirely different set of rules, an entirely different set of systems, and he's still on the outside looking in. Well, I think the thing about Oliver that I kind of, that, that you know, Barry talked a lot about that I, I think is really important is that Oliver is middle class. He comes from an incredibly loving family, a really nice house. He wants to be special. That's the thing that he has. It's, it's not just as sort of straightforward as a kind of ladder, it's, it's that he wants to be something really special. And that, I think a lot of us feel that way, and it's often quite nebulous, and you don't know how or why, and he sees <coughs> Felix through the window, and he thinks, that, that's it, that's the thing he could never quite get. Um, and yes, it's just, you know, he has to learn very quickly. I think his gift is working out what people want and giving it to them, even though he can never quite get the thing he wants himself. But he has to learn quickly, you know, what they want and to give it to them discreetly. How early on did the uh, Barry Kehoe come into the process? I know you've described the collaboration between you and him as being like holding hands and jumping off a cliff together when you were making this. <laughs> yeah, sliding down a drain together. <laughs> <laughs> I had seen Killing of a Sacred Deer and I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. I want to say thank you so I've made it. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, the film itself is just so amazing, but he was just this like 
bolt out of the blue. And so, um, you know, I think this film really needed somebody, Oliver, it ne we never leave Oliver's side, it's all his point of view. And so it needed somebody who had that kind of vulnerability that Barry has, and the kind of like insane sex appeal. But that otherworldly kind of strangeness that, um, so you're never quite sure, you never quite can touch what's really going on. And I think that's a kind of very important part of, of Oliver and, and yeah, I just can't imagine it without Barry. I, I, you know, finished the script and I met with him and he'd read it and he was like, go on then. <laughs> that was it. Great. <laughs> he does have this quality. There are certain actors where the you, their performances tend to kind of like blow you back in a way. And he is one of those actors where you really feel yourself kind of leaning in as he's doing stuff. I mean, Spencer Tracy had that, there are other actors that have had that, where you, you feel like there's just something kind of compelling that's just pulling you in as you're watching them. Totally, he has this, he has a, I call, I said to him, it's sort of like shark eyes, you know, sharks. <laughs> I learned this, I think, from the Dawling Kimsley shark book when I was about eight, so <laughs> this may not be factually correct. <laughs> but I've read, and always remembered that sharks have kind of double eyelids. And so when their first eyelid comes, that's the f that's you could, it's sort of imperceptible, but that's when they're about to attack. And Barry has this thing where you know you can just keep the camera on him, and he just doesn't move. He doesn't move, but his but the eyelid comes, the shark eyelid comes down, and it's just the most mesmerizing. You know, he's just he's just extraordinary, and he's also the sort of you know this is I guess in some ways an, an unusual film. <laughs> Co <-cosign. laughs> but he and I just, you know, we wanted the same thing always. So there was never, you know, a lot of people have asked about the, the you know, the grave or, you know, the final scene, the dance sequence. But he just, it was just never. It was kind of not an inevitability because we always talk about things. But he just profoundly understood. And we both trusted each other very deeply and fought a lot, of course, because you do in a nice way, I hope. Um, but when it came to the big stuff, he just didn't, didn't bow on it. Yeah, there's a, there's a fearlessness to that performance where I think a lot of actors might have been, lick a bathtub? Yeah, okay, I'll do it. Hump a grave? Nope, sorry, that's my line. And Barry just kind of just goes right for it. But also because he takes it seriously. Because that's the thing for me as well, is that it's a really interesting one, this film. I, I, you know, will go to my grave, and hopefully any, anyone is welcome to despoil, frankly. Um, I, you, you realize that mic's on, right? I can't believe really this film. No one's going to be like, hugely surprised. Um, I, I, I think it's very serious. I think being in love is very serious business. I think sex is sad often, really fucking sad and lonely and the sort of things that we think about and that we do when we're in a kind of distressing level of obsession and desire aren't beautiful or they are beautiful but they're complicated and Catherine Brie, who is just one of you know, my favourite directors she said um, the tension really the tension of, of kind of love isn't it's not it's not about kind of sex it's between beauty and revulsion that's the tension and so that's you know what this film is about at every stage and so when I said lick the drain you know obviously look I mean it's in, it's in the script of you it's not you know he's not giggling you know he's not laughing it's a serious business he's out of his mind, and the same with the grave as an act of kind of profound grief that takes a very kind of depraved and funny and chilling kind of turn. So I think that's the other thing with him is that I think fear is sort of interesting. Said he was fearless, he is fearless, but it's but I suppose it's not the right thing. It's like he doesn't feel shame around things because he wants them to be true. Um, and that's what it sounds very kind of scolding. <laughs> I know that there are things in this film that kind of squirmy, and, and it is sort of funny. Of course, it's funny because sex is also quite funny. But he, um, no, he doesn't fuck around, and nor do I. 
you know? I want to talk about getting the rest of the cast together in this ensemble, because it is a good ensemble. But while we're on this subject, I, I have to say, if you have a real knack for for creating these characters or working with these characters that, um, I think you've referred to them as sympathy for the devil characters, where they're characters that you want to be repulsed by, you are repulsed by sometimes, that you feel like, I don't want to be around these people, and yet you're compelled by them, and you even start to become kind of sympathetic or empathetic with them. Uh, I think Eve is that way, I think Cassandra is that way, I certainly think Oliver's that way. When you're conceiving of these characters and when you're directing these scenes, how are you finding that balance so that you're staying true to, uh, for lack of a better word, the repulsiveness of some of these characteristics and yet still keeping people going along in this ride with them? Um, I guess I guess it's because like I suppose like most people who do what I do, I've, I've got quite a healthy dollop of self-loathing. Um, and I'm not under, well I probably am under lots of illusions about in what way I'm a bad person, I suppose. That's the, that's the thing that we often don't know. But I think that it was the same for promising a woman, and it's the same for this. Everybody wakes up in the morning and thinks they're a bad person. You know, we all think we're good, but you know, would the you know, would the person at the airport that you just interacted with last on a cranky day say you were a good person? You know, it's all relative. And so for me, it's always just about like what's sort of honest. You know, Oliver, you know, in many ways he's kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> or at least honest. And I think, um, you know, it's the same with Felix. Like, you know, he's a nice enough guy. He's just very weak. And very entitled, and Rosalind, you know, Elspeth Catton, I mean, like, how could she be a bad person? She's just so fucking great, you know? Like, you don't, we don't care, do we care? Do, uh, that's the thing, it's like, it's not for us to make moral judgments about people, it's to kind of, I, you know, I want, I, want people, I want us all to relate to it, I guess. Well, when you've got somebody like Rosalind Pike showing up on screen, you know, you want to relate to her, and then she says something along the lines of like, oh, I can't stand ugliness. I don't want anything to do with ugliness. And then you suddenly find yourself being like, okay, where am I with this person? Like, I want to like them, but you're making this very hard for me, ma'am. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, like, you cast somebody like Rajan Pike so she can do that, but let's talk a little bit about getting the rest of the cast together. Um, well, it was, it was sort of quite straightforward. I did a lot of begging. I begged Rosmond because I was just, she's just such a gifted comic actress. And I just thought, she's, you know, I just really wanted to see her do something like thrillingly kind of comic. Um, Richard was the same. And then Alison Oliver and um, Archie did two of the most like brilliant auditions I've ever seen in my life. Um, and Jacob, it was really interesting. It was very hard. Felix was the hardest character to cast because actually, being the golden boy is, in, in lots of ways, it, it could be kind of boring, or he could be one note. A lot of people came in and did a kind of Sebastian Flight-esque, sort of louche, kind of almost period thing. And and Jacob just came in as Felix. And he was just a dope, you know? He was just like the kind of guy that you would like lose your mind over in 2006, and, and of course now. But that just was like, kind of a silly Billy, you know? Like just not a serious person, I suppose, as, as um, they would say in succession. And um, there was something so touching about it. And again, it was just that thing of he understood, he understood what the character was, and he was the only person who came in and he was like, oh, he's just a guy. He just happens to be really beautiful and rich, but he's just a guy, he's just some guy. Oliver's by far the more interesting, virtuous, fascinating, but you know, Felix is just like, you know, he's just got a great eyebrow piercing. <laughs> Handsome, dumb, and entitled. What's, you know, what could go wrong? Uh, was there a reason that you said this in 2006? I mean, I'm sure there was a reason, but I mean, they as opposed to like the 20s or 30s or 40s, which is what we normally associate with this genre. Well, I think it needed to be kind of modern day or as close to as possible, because that's kind of what's interesting about this stuff, right? That still exists. They're still watching Superbad. They're still, you know, eating knickknacks. They're still in of the world and then completely out of it. Um, you know, again, the sort of structural thing meant the Freddy narrative meant that it needed to be in the 
we needed to know something had happened in the past. And then just from a purely cynical point of view, uh, it was the last year in England that you could smoke inside. And, and so it, it, nothing makes something look like a period drama more than somebody lighting up in a pub, because you go, what? It's so transgressive still. Um, you know, the music's amazing and the clothes are terrible. And I think that it knocks the glamour off it a little bit. We need to have a, that, that slight feeling of, you know, no matter how rich you are, your fake tan is still kind of clotted around your wrists because Santa, you know, Santa Fe hadn't quite got their recipe right yet. <laughs> you know, and, and your hair extensions were sort of dodgy and, you know, we, we needed to feel a little bit of distance, I think, for it to really work. Uh, I know it's a cliche to, you often hear that people be like, oh no, the, the, the city, the city is another character in the story, or, or the set, the set is such a character in the story, and you're like, yeah, okay, sure. And yet, um, I will say that this house, that Saltburn itself, uh, does seem to be a particularly strong member of this ensemble cast. Uh, how does one find a place like this when you're looking for it? Do you go on Zillow and it's just sort of country estate must suggest aristotic rock, must have a uh, tuffery maze, like... Yeah, you just text daddy. <laughs> you make more <laughs> Somebody asked if it was my house. <laughs> Last week I was like, oh my god, I wish. It wouldn't let me in it if it was. But um, we just asked around for a long time. It was really, really hard to find it because we needed something that hadn't been seen before, something that felt lived in, something that was enormous, you know, that wasn't a golf club that hadn't been turned into flats. And um, we asked around, 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 and this amazing family thought it might be interesting. And so I went up to meet them and, you know, uh, part of the stipulation of us doing it, because there, are, there aren't even photographs. There, there weren't photographs of the house on the internet. Like, nobody knew it existed. Um, we're not allowed to talk about, we're not allowed to say the name of the house or where it is or who the family are that live there, that was part of the deal. Um, so it kind of, yeah, it's sort of this sort of magic secret place, I guess. So no saltburn tours, no buses going by? Look, I can't, th whatever they want to do, I wholeheartedly support it. Get that merch. <laughs> Saltburn t-shirts and beanies available out in the lobby. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the decision to shoot this in Academy Ratio and coming up with the look of this because it does have um, it does have a particularly wonderful singular look for still being a country estate, a recognizable English country estate movie. Well, I think there are kind of um, a few practical considerations. Um, obviously, the house is very tall. Um, and square, and so actually if you're kind of shooting an anamorphic, we would have missed an enormous amount of it. Also, I like to be, me and Nina's like to be very, very close in and close-ups, and then, you know, the more square you are, the more face fills the screen, you're not kind of bothering with all the stuff in the deep background. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of our references were sort of paintings, sort of Caravaggio and Gainsborough portraits, and. Um, it makes it much easier to have that kind of formal composition the squarer you are. And then, you know, it just, we, we went and on the recce, we kind of shot in various different ways, we did some tests and it just, there wasn't really another, there wasn't really another option and it, and it feels like the Captain, you know, the Captain Playhouse box that Oliver opens, you always have this kind of voyeuristic sense of, sort of peeping in. Uh, before we go, I, I think we would be remiss to not talk about the ending. Um, was this part of the original conception when you were coming up with the story? Was this something that kind of came late in the game when you're thinking, how can I give Oliver the happy ending that he deserves? You know, and just yeah. kind of filming it. <laughs> Thank you, it is a happy ending. Um, so, um, it was originally, it was going to be the exact inverse of Felix's tall, naked, walking. So, you know, obviously with Felix is tall, we, we, we kind of shot it. Oliver's been sleeping in the king's bedroom, which still has Henry VIII's bunk on it, and is walking, um, is walking back. And, 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 you know, I just, about halfway through shooting, I just thought, it's not enough. It doesn't have the joy and the jubilation of a kind of post-coital feeling that it needs to have. And so, as I would often do, I'd say, Barry, Barry, and he'd say, yeah, 
um, would it, if if it was an orc, if it was a dance to Sophie Anastasia's murder on the dance floor, what would you say? <laughs> like, no, no, that was it. Because again, you know, it made sense. It does make sense, and I think that's one of the weirder things about this movie is that it actually feels like it's the proper ending for this story. Well, you know, he gets what he wants, or and he, then he doesn't get anything that he wants. You know, so it feels like it's kind of it's both it's both kind of lovely and it's jubilant and sexy and crazy and but it's also kind of empty and lonely and sad. And, you know, he's just there with his rocks and his theatre. You know, for how long? Thank you so much for coming out here tonight. Thank you guys. So much. <laughs>